Welcome to Know Your Stuff, a program aimed at educating on historical concepts and societal issues. My name is Anne Raza. Today we are joined by William Bill Black, former financial regulator and an academic. He's also a professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and is the author of the book called The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. Bill, thanks for your time. Thank you. So let us start with finance. We often hear the stories of financiers, hedge funds, and philanthropy, or top 50 Forbes lists, but we rarely hear the story of a financial regulator, which you were during the 80s. Talk about the role of a financial re regulator, what it is, and how does an eventful day look like? So the role of a financial regulator is heavily contested. I'll tell you what it meant uh, back in our day. Uh, when I joined the agency, which was April 2nd, 1984, and I can only remember that because it was the second birthday of our first child, um, it was supposed to be a very quiet job. Um, you, banks rarely failed. They certainly weren't conceived as failing due to fraud. And so, and it was uh, anti-regulatory times. And it was anti-regulatory times in both of our major parties in the United States. The Democrats and the Republicans agreed. Regulators really weren't supposed to do much regulation. And so the joke in the industry we regulated was that it was run under the 363 rule. Borrow money at 3%, loan money at 6%, and be on the golf course by 3 p.m. And, uh, you know, the regulators could uh, join them at 4.30 uh, type of thing, except we didn't have enough money to, uh, you know, weren't paid enough to uh, uh, afford the good golf courses. Okay, so in the 1980s, one could argue you, you were quite aggressive uh, uh, pursuing white-collar criminals. You were responsible uh, for re-regulating the savings and loan industry and prosecuted over 1,000 elite white-collar criminals. For our viewers, please explain what the savings and loans crisis was and thereafter talk about the fraud that you uncovered during that, that time. Right, so that sleepy world that I was talking about had actually ended several years earlier. So the first thing you need to know about savings and loans is that in that day, they made very long-term loans, typically 30 years, at a fixed interest rate. And that meant if interest rates went up a whole lot, the market value of those mortgages was going to fall really sharply. And um, the head of our central bank, the Federal Reserve in the United States, increased interest rates to unprecedented levels in U.S. history, above 20%. And so every savings and loan was insolvent on a market value basis. There were roughly 3,000 of them, and they were insolvent by about uh, a total of $150 billion. We were also the federal insurance fund for the industry. And we had $6 billion in the till for the insurance fund. Well, 150 billion is a whole lot bigger uh, than 6 billion. All right, so that was the first phase of the crisis. It's called the interest rate risk phase. And that's basically 1979 to 1982. By 1983, there are 300 savings and loans, and every one of them is a growing at least 50% a year. Now, the rule of thumb in banking is if you grow more than 25% a year, you're probably going to collapse. Uh, and many of these weren't growing just 50%. Some of them were growing more than 1,000% a year. Those entities were the frauds. And so what we had to have was this enormous change in the way we thought about things, where we could conceive of a seemingly legitimate financial entity as actually a criminal enterprise run not for the benefit of the bank, but for the benefit of the CEO. And using all the seeming legitimacy and all the power the CEO can bring to bear of a major corporation to run those frauds. So what happened? We decided to, we called it autopsy, every failure. Uh, 1983, 1984, to look for patterns. And we did. We found what we called the fraud recipe, which had four ingredients. One, 
grow like crazy, 50% or more a year. Two, and here's the real kicker, by making really, really, really crappy loans, horrible loans in quality, but with a high nominal yield. Now you could hear me stress the word nominal because of course, if you make super risky loans and you charge say 14% when most people are charging 8%, you're not actually gonna get 14% because a lot of those loans are gonna default. So the nominal rate is just the contract rate. What matters is what you can actually collect. The third thing was extreme leverage. That's just jargon for a whole lot of debt compared to equity. So equity is what protects you against failure. If you have a whole lot of debt compared to equity, you're much more vulnerable to failure. And fourth, by setting aside virtually no loss reserves, for, remember those inevitable losses of making really risky loans are gonna have tons and tons of losses. Well, they set aside virtually nothing as a reserve for those. If you do those four things, which are super simple to do, a moron can do those four things then there are three sure things we discovered. One, the savings and loan would promptly report that it was the most profitable savings and loan in America. Two, under modern executive compensation, the officers would be made incredibly wealthy. And third, but only many years later, potentially, the institution would fail catastrophically. And so this changed everything about how we regulated. We realized we weren't dealing with risk, really. We were really dealing with deliberate frauds. And we also recognized because of this recipe that they had an Achilles heel that we could go after. We had very few people, very little money, as I told you, to be able to close the frauds. We could, couldn't close the great bulk of the frauds. We didn't have the funds to do it. And so we restricted growth. That was their Achilles heel, because these are in essence Ponzi schemes. In a Ponzi scheme, you survive by paying off the old folks with new money you're bringing in. So you have to grow extremely rapidly. Well, by restricting growth, we doomed those institutions. But we did more. We went after them when they were the most politically powerful entities in many ways in America. They were able to recruit the second most powerful elected official in America. That's called the Speaker of the House. His name was Jim Wright then, but also five U.S. senators. We only have 100 U.S. senators to try to stop our crackdowns. And we proceeded despite this political opposition. And then, as you said, we embarrassed the Department of Justice into prosecuting. The way we did it was by making criminal referrals. But what we did was make public every month how many criminal referrals we had made. And pretty soon the Washington Post was asking the Department of Justice every month, wait a minute, there are 3,000 criminal referrals, but there are only 12 cases pending of prosecutions. What's going on? And eventually the Department of Justice was getting kicked so much, we eventually made over 30,000 criminal referrals that they made a deal with us. And the deal was, we'll work with you to create the 100 worst fraud schemes in the country. Those involved 310 savings and loans and about 600 individuals. So this is the most elite of the elite. Our phrase then, our motto, was never be the ones chasing mice while lions roam the campsite. So we went after the lions, all right? And the people with the immense political power and prioritize them for the prosecution. Now they have the best criminal defense lawyers in the world, America still does some things well, and they'll spend money like water to keep the CEO out of prison. But we had a more than a 90% conviction rate uh, and we convicted over a thousand of these elites of felony. It was harder in that era to actually get prison time, but we got prison time for 80% of them. It's the greatest success against elite white collar criminals and prosecutions his, is still uh, even today. And we did this despite all of their immense political intervention. And ultimately we so embarrassed the politicians that even the sleaziest of them were wearing buttons, literally six inches in diameter, 
that said, jail the SNL crooks. Now, it was complete hypocrisy, but it tells you that you had won. So it can be done. Regulation can succeed. But many people had to give up their careers and are absolutely unemployable. People at our most senior levels, they will let, the frauds will attack you using anything. And so people had their careers destroyed because they were gay, for example. They were fired with the Speaker of the House, a Democratic Speaker of the House, uh, demanding that they be removed because on the grounds that they were gay. So this reminds me of the 2008 financial crisis in terms of Ponzi scheme, not in terms of criminal prosecutions. But before we talk about the connection between the savings and loans crisis and the 2008 crisis, I want to talk to you briefly about uh, the infrastructure of the financial industry. I'm talking, for example, about high frequency trading and also about the methods that are used to gamble, like stock buybacks or derivatives. Could you, for our young viewers, uh, explain the infrastructure as well as the methods that are used to profit? Okay, so the key is nobody wants to gamble. Uh, a gamble has very little chance of winning a high-risk gamble. And so the art is the sure thing. And the sure thing is fraud and predation and having advantage. So let me give you an example. You mentioned high-frequency trading. So high-frequency trading, uh, the trades are made not through humans making decisions because we're too slow, but through algorithms uh, that we've created. And basically they say this, when Corporation A's stock goes up, usually Corporation B's stock goes up thereafter. And so as soon as you know we have an algorithm that monitors prices, as soon as A goes up, literally within nanoseconds, a nanosecond is an incredibly <laughs> short amount of time, uh, an order goes out to buy B. And that's great, but it's not a sure thing. So what do they do to do a sure thing? Well, for example, my university, the University of Michigan, where I got most of my training, puts out something called the Business Confidence Index, and that moves markets. So if, when it comes out, if it says business is more confident, stock market prices will rise. So people doing high-frequency trading bought access to that before it was publicly disclosed. And to its shame, the university actually did that. But here's the additional scam. So that was like a group of a couple hundred folks that they gave this um, premature access to so that they could trade quicker than other folks. But then it, in secret, they had another tier. And that other tier only got like a, a one minute Right? The other folks got like a half hour to an hour of extra notice. These other folks only got like one additional minute earlier. And so they scammed all the scammers because they, all the algorithms essentially are the same, right? Because the data is the same. If, if A, then B. And so you know what the other guys are going to do. And if you know what the other guys are able to do and you're going to trade first, well, you know, then you can... Well, there's a bad word for it in the in the trade that we, we don't want to use. Uh, but uh, these are very nasty uh, uh, practices. That's an example of a sure thing that poses as a risk, poses as if it were a technological advance. But it does nothing for good for the world. It just divides up who will be the winners and the most elite folks with the greatest wealth that can have these systems are going to be the winners. But here's the further kicker. Because these algorithms are the same, because the data is the same, there's a huge danger that we'll all do the same thing. So I told you about if stock A goes up, then stock B goes up, and therefore we buy stock B as soon as we see stock A increase. The same thing works on the downside. If stock A goes down, stock C tends to go down so what do we do? We all sell C, but what if all of us try to sell C at the same time? Well, guess what? Market makers, they lose money. In fact, they go bankrupt and then markets collapse. What happens to market value of something if there's no market, if you can't sell it, right? Then prices 
decline catastrophically and then more folks go bankrupt. And this was the flash crash, but before it, it was Black Monday in the United States and it's an enormous risk to the world. So we do something, we allow something, this hyperfrequency trading that provides no net benefits to the world, aids the sleaziest folks and creates an enormous, what we call systemic risk, a risk that the whole system can be brought down. It is crazy. And that is emblematic of so much of finance. It's a rigged system and it's crazy. It creates crises, right? So other infrastructure, the economists um, loved what they called the shadow financial sector in the United States. And they loved it because it had essentially no regulation. And their ideology said, if there's no regulation and no deposit insurance, it'll be super safe and it'll be stable. And even if it isn't, who cares? It's one rich guy ripping off another rich guy. What could that hurt? Well, it turns out what it can do is plunge the entire world into the great financial crisis, right? So this was pure ideology. I've described the first two acts of the savings and loan debacle, the first being the interest rate phase and the second being the fraud phase, the 300s. Right at the end, right, while we were super busy fighting the second phase, all those prosecutions, uh, all the enforcement actions, civil actions that we brought to make sure they kept none of the fraud money, right? Completely different than in 2008. A new scam arose. And in America, all good financial scams start in Orange County, California, which was, uh, you know, back in the day, a hotbed of right wing um, anti-regulatory type stuff. And we uh, had jurisdiction over that particular area, right? And so our examiners came to us and said, this is crazy. They're, the lenders are not even checking on the borrower's income to verify what the borrower's income. This has to end in disaster. And so while we were super busy dealing with the second act of the crisis, we knocked off a team of people and they went after these Orange County folks who were not only making bad loans, they were also for the first time really engaging in substantial predation. Predation particularly against blacks and Latinos and most particularly against elderly female blacks uh, who are often widowed, right? The people they viewed as the most vulnerable. So this is really nasty stuff. And we, by 1994, drove the absolute last one doing that out of the industry. They voluntarily gave up federal deposit insurance for the sole purpose of escaping our jurisdiction. And they became the third act of the savings and loan crisis. And that act actually grows for 14 years and produces the great financial crisis. That entity, uh, was called Long Beach Savings. It gave up deposit insurance, so it became a mortgage bank, called itself AmeriQuest. And as I uh, always tell people, so first we pushed them out because they were so sleazy of the entire industry. Second, uh, on the way out, where we have no more jurisdiction over them as banking regulators, the Department of Justice still had jurisdiction over them for discriminatory lending on the basis of race and ethnicity. So we made a referral to the Department of Justice. They slammed uh, AmeriQuest, that was the second. The third time around, the Federal Trade Commission slammed them. The fourth time around, 49 state attorney generals brought an action against AmeriQuest. Now after those that entire pattern over the course of 10 years, of fraud and predation, did we make the CEO, Roland Arnau, A, a guest of our prisons, or B, did we make him our ambassador to the Netherlands? And of course, the answer is we made him our ambassador to the Netherlands. Why? Because he was the largest contr political contributor in the nation to the President of the United States, George Bush. So I want to connect the savings and loan crisis with the uh, big crash in 2008. 
Although you guys went after so many white collar criminals, why did it continue? And B, why were there no prosecutions following to 2008? What happened during that period? So that's what we were just discussing. Why was it able to continue? Because it was in the shadow financial sector. And uh, the federal regulators, us, could no longer take any action against them. We have no jurisdiction uh, to do so. Why beyond that? Well, because the ideology, as I said, of orthodox economists was, oh, the shadow sector is perfectly safe, right? Everybody will have the right incentives because the government isn't there. We all know regulators don't do anything. Well, of course, we had just proven the lie to that. So who cares that there's no regulation? There will be self-regulation. What uh, in economic jargon is called private market discipline. But of course, the, lend the lenders are supposed to provide that discipline. They're supposed to refuse to lend to bad folks. Instead, what they did is form these incredibly tight partnerships, right? So AmeriQuest no longer has deposit insurance. That should make it hard for it to get money to make loans. So what does it do? It gets into a really close dancing relationship with Wall Street, which is also shadow financial regulatory sector. The big five investment banks had essentially no federal regulation. Eventually they created uh, a fake, you know, Potemkin uh, regulation, but it was, everybody knew it was designed to be a farce, right? So they were getting no effective regulation. Well, why are the lenders willing to make terrible loans to people who are often not repay them? Because the same fraud recipe that I talked about works for both the lender and the investment bank. The officers get rich, even though the institutions are gonna suffer catastrophic losses. And three of the big five investment banks in the United States, massive institutions failed as a result of the, these frauds that their officers were running and assisting. Why, why no prosecutions? Well, first thing is the United States is a federal system as is Germany. And that means that there's dual sovereignty. The states have sovereignty and the national government has sovereignty. But when it comes to a collision between these two in the United States context, it's called the supremacy clause. It means the feds win. And so the state attorney generals, as I mentioned, were the ones who were going after these really sleazy folks. A, because they're the ones who had the jurisdiction, uh, but B, because they were less political than the federal government. And so they were doing these successful actions. What was the federal regulatory response? To preempt, to use that supremacy clause that says the states can't do anything if the feds don't want them to do it. And so instead of blocking the way we had, in investigating the way we had and prosecuting the way we had, the federal regulators were doing everything possible, not only to themselves not look, but to make sure that the states couldn't look. And if you don't investigate, what is there to make a criminal prosecution on, right? If we put our hands in front of our faces and close our ears and such, we see nothing, we say nothing, uh, and that is basically what they did. So they also destroyed the criminal referral process. Remember I told you just our one little agency, these federal banking agencies were much bigger than us. Just our little agency made over 30,000 criminal referrals. Well, all of the federal agencies, regulatory agencies combined made fewer than a dozen, fewer than 12 criminal referrals in the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, wow. We knew how to succeed. You create task forces in the epicenters of fraud. And we know what the epicenters of these fraud, and we know it's the same recipe, right? It is the third act of the savings and loan debacle that simply was allowed to grow in the shadow sector for 14 years. And here's three warnings that your viewers really need to know about. The first one is in the year 2000. Now think how early that was. 
And actually, they began the efforts in 1998, and those efforts were known to the federal regulators in 1998. So that's a full decade before Lehman Brothers collapses. It's appraisers. And the appraisal fraud was a major feature of the savings and loan debacle, and they did the same thing in the great financial crisis. So you want to, as a fraudulent lender, inflate the appraisal greatly. Um, the appraisal is the market value of your home. Of uh, homes, you basically the home. value the home higher than an actual value it is. That's what you mean by appraisal, right? That's correct. So you're inflating the market value of the home that is pledged as security for the loan. And the whole purpose of this is to make the loan look much, much safer, right? We wanna artificially inflate what appears to be the safety of this loan because the lower the risk, perceived risk, the higher the price in finance, all right? So this is gonna be a scam that's gonna further hyperinflate the bubble. And again, this is not a new scam. This was the same savings and loan heart of the scam that we had prosecuted. So the appraisers saw it because the way this scam works is from the banks. The bankers extort the appraisers to inflate the appraisals and they blacklist you. In other words, they send you no business if you are honest, right? right? So utterly perverse. They, and the appraisers in 2000 publicly online created a petition explaining in really clear terms exactly what I've said. They didn't pull any punches and eventually 11,000 appraisers signed that petition. And they were all risking losing all of their business by signing that petition, right? Because that's the last thing in the world that the lenders wanted was honest appraisers. So that's the first warning. Again, a full decade before Lehman. And what was done, of course, nothing. Second warning from the FBI, and not just like a random FBI, the senior FBI official in charge of dealing with mortgage fraud. In September 2004, he testifies publicly in front of Congress, and then he deliberately gives a whole series of press conferences and interviews. And he says two things. One, there is an epidemic, his word, epidemic of mortgage fraud developing. And two, he predicts that it will produce a financial crisis. Crisis, his word, not my interpretation of it. So you can't have a better warning than that from our premier law enforcement entity with specialization in white collar crime. The third one in spring of 2006, this one is by the industries, the mortgage industries own anti-fraud experts um, who are called MARI, right? Mortgage Asset Research Institute. And they said, this kind of loan, remember I told you that this new kind of loan developed uh, around 2000 as the, um, as, I'm sorry, uh, 1990, um, as the third act of the savings and loan debacle where you didn't verify the borrower's income. That was just called low documentation loan back in our era. But by this era, 2006, behind closed doors, the industry called these liars loans, which lacks a certain subtlety, right? So they studied these liars loans, which were easy to study because you could check them against tax returns, right? So we know exactly what the income really was, and we know what was on um, the loan application forms. And the incidence of fraud was 90%, 9-0, right? They were virtually all fraudulent. And if you think this was due to trying to loan to minorities or poor people, no, no government regulator in the United States ever required, suggested, encouraged making liar's loans. They did exactly the opposite. And think, wait a minute, if the goal is to loan to people with low income, is inflating their income massively a good way to achieve that goal? Obviously not, all right? So this is the third great warning and what did the industry do in response? It increased from 2003 through 2006 
the amount of liar's loans by over 500%. The loans that hyperinflated the bubble were liar's loans. The whole use of the phrase, this is the subprime crisis, is a myth. By 2006, half of all the loans the industry called subprime were also liar's loans. They're not mutually exclusive. And there's a recent study by a wonderful economist, uh, Professor Herndon, that looks for the first time at what actually produced the losses, not simply the defaults. A default is when you don't pay the loan. Uh, the loss is what you really care about. And he found that 70% of the total losses came from liar's loans, right? So those we had all those three warnings. Nobody could claim that I couldn't see it coming. So uh, I want to get to the solution aspect of this. But before I do, my first question is, are we heading to a catastrophe again? Has things changed? And B, what are the solutions to this? Should we see banking, given the huge risk it has on society, as a utility? Um, or should we just reform the banks and have them the same way they have been before? Uh, utility, I mean, li by like the way we receive water, it's, it's in the public hands. So uh, could you answer those two questions before we leave you? <laughs> yes. So let me start with the utility. And indeed, we use that phrase in the United States uh, as well. Um, and that's the role that postal service banks played in many places including the United States, uh, including Scandinavia, uh, Japan uh, as well. So uh, it's relatively easy to use the postal system that uh, you know all, all people all over the world tend to have access to. Um, and you can have a low risk savings that doesn't do any of these insane things that blow up the world. How should you view banks? Well, in addition to what we've already said, at the same time, that these massive frauds were going on. And remember, many of these frauds were actually larger in Europe than in the United States, right? So, and you have people that are not just cheating in one area, they're cheating in everything. So they cheat on taxes, their own taxes. They help rich people cheat on their taxes. They help money launder for terrorists, but they money launder for the drug cartels that are incredibly murderous uh, and such. They cheated on LIBOR. They cheated on foreign exchange, right? Those two cartels are the largest cartels in world history by three orders of magnitude. They're a thousand times larger than anything we've seen before. So you asked me about banks. A, every large bank that was a member of the LIBOR system had to cheat to make the cheating work. The same was true in foreign exchange. So it isn't outliers that are cheating. It's not small banks that are cheating. It's the largest, most prestigious banks in the world. And that's because they're really operating as criminal enterprises. And they don't just defraud, they also predate. So uh, if you have viewers in the United Kingdom, they'll be very familiar with the payment protection insurance scandal. In the United States, the variant was you come in for a loan um, and the lender I know, I'm the loan broker, you come to me for a loan, to arrange a loan. I know that the bank is willing to loan to you at 8%, but if I can get you to agree to pay 10% instead, I get a kickback from the bank, right? That was a massive scam in the United States. Uh, Wells Fargo and the cross-selling. So it isn't just that they're fraudsters. It isn't just that they violate the criminal law. They're also predate, and so their real business plan at many a large bank is find customers, cheat customers. That's the business plan, right? So do we desperately need a public utility? Yes, that doesn't have that mentality. But worse than that, these fraud and predation schemes cause the entire system to break down. So here's an example. Everybody has been to some kind of party uh, or meeting in which everybody got a bottle of water, right? Um, so how many of us would drink that bottle of water 
if we knew that just one in 100 was fouled with something vile. I didn't think I would drink it. Exactly. So long before fraud becomes endemic, it can cause entire markets to break down because it breaks down trust. And trust is one of the most important things in society. So how should we look at banks? We should look at banks as the greatest danger uh, to the ones that make impossible, quote unquote, free markets. They rig markets and they rig markets in ways that are really horrible for people. And in they're not alone. They drive the financial incentives that help produce things like the VW uh, scandal. I mean, think of that. That is a fraud involving at least 12 million frauds over a decade from the highest level of the organization where they not only cheat, but then they say, aha, people might find we were cheating. So let's go create a algorithm again that looks for testing. And as soon as we know we're testing, we'll create a phony engine performance uh, to scam. So it's a scam upon a scam upon a scam. These things are clever, but they're, that one literally kills people, right? When you lie about emission levels and actually produce vehicles that have emission levels of the NOx, in that case, nitrous oxides, uh, five times what they purport, uh, the result is that people die. So that's how we should look at them. Uh, Deutsche Bank is one of the largest criminal enterprises in the world. And instead of being shut down, it is the, the entity that is A, constantly given bailout treatment, and B, is allowed to grow. I mean, the idea of allowing it to merge with Commerzbank is uh, crazy. Uh, and C, it delays all effective regulatory um, restrictions because uh, Angela Merkel says, well, no, 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 the EU can't adopt these really strict Basel rules because Deutsche Bank would fail them. And so the world system of increasing capital was disrupted for the sole benefit of Commerzbank and uh, you know, Deutsche Bank. This is nuts. Bill, let's uh, pick up this conversation in the future and talk about solutions. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you guys for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to donate, because if you don't, we won't be able to produce independent and non-profit news and analysis. My name is Zen Raza. See you guys next time. <laughs>